Hello? This is a wake-up call for overpriced mobile plans. For unlimited standard calls, SMS and MMS with incredible coverage, see aldimobile.com.au forward slash wake up. Great plans at Aldi prices. T's and C's apply. Uh, okay. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. The following podcast contains accounts of sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. We all just feel so disempowered and so silenced, and it's a really horrible thing to be silenced, especially when we, we, we were not silenced before. This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. We've received a lot of messages in the last couple of days from listeners confused and concerned about reports that Victorian survivors of sexual assault are now prevented from telling their own stories by a new piece of legislation. This comes just months after old laws gagging survivors were scrapped in Tasmania and the Northern Territory. In May, we featured a Tasmanian woman called Janelle O'Connor on Australian True Crime who told her story under her own name for the first time. And we've reissued that episode in case you missed it as a reminder of why these laws are so damaging to survivors. Janelle was introduced to us by journalist Nina Fennell, who's a tireless advocate for the rights of survivors of sexual abuse. She's the creator of the Let Her Speak campaign which was designed to highlight the old laws still on the books in some Australian states. It was Nina who broke the story about the troubling changes to Victorian legislation on news.com.au last week. She's put in months of painstaking work with another of our favourite journalists, Sherelle Moody, who created the Australian Femicide and Child Death Map, which documents every violent death of an Australian woman and child dating back to the 1800s. These women do nothing by halves, and unbelievably, Nina's article was the first place many survivors discovered the existence of the new law and the fact that they'd broken it many times. Equally unbelievable to my mind is the suggestion being bandied about that it's not really that big of a deal. Some people might try to tell you it's as simple as a misplaced word that can easily be fixed... Well, Nina Fennell is here to tell you all the reasons why that is not the case. So on February 7 this year, very quietly when no one was really paying much attention, partly because of bushfires and then COVID, the laws in Victoria have did change and they've changed in such a way that it's now a crime for sexual assault survivors to speak to the media under their real name in cases where there is a conviction in place against the offender and also in cases where the matter is still before the courts. So for sexual assault survivors who are in that position, including those who might have gotten a conviction against their offender five years ago, 20 years ago, you know, at any point in time, they are now all prohibited from being identified in the media. And the only way around this is if they go back to court and they get a court order that says they're allowed to be identified. So this is affecting a lot of people. It's not just sexual assault survivors who are going through the court system now. It's any survivor. And that includes, you know, a whole lot of clergy abuse victims, those who have come out of Ballarat, some of whom have been doing public advocacy work for decades and who are now all of a sudden being told, hold on, you're not allowed to be named. You'll have to go back to court if you want to continue to do that advocacy work. Yeah, and other people who have been relying upon public support to help them push their cases forward, who have been very, very deliberately public about their cases, now suddenly have been silenced again. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a couple of quite high profile cases coming up soon. There's one case involving sisters who now can't be named, who have been very, very vocal. And and that advocacy work that they've done and that media work that they've done has been really, really critical in actually pushing the justice system forward. And so to hobble them in such a way by saying, well, um, even though you could speak last year, you could speak in January this year, now you can't. That actually significantly compromises their capacity to speak to media in a way that's effective and that has cut through. 
And I know that most people affected by this new law didn't know it existed until they read your story. How is that possible? Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of media outlets didn't know it existed either. Um, And I think that the reason why this has happened, that no one knew about it, is because the intention when they changed the law was not a malicious one. They were actually trying to fix a different part of legislation that had to do with suppression orders. And that's fine. They were going about fixing that. But when they made those changes with one problem in mind, I think they had tunnel vision. They were laser focused on the thing that they were trying to fix, that they didn't pay attention to the broader implications of other errors that they were introducing. So because of that, I mean, the irony is, is that when they had the parliamentary debate about it, they actually patted themselves on the back and said, we're doing a great thing for survivors today, not realising that while they were actually benefiting a very small number of survivors in cases where there were existing suppression orders over the whole case, they were creating a problem for the majority of other survivors with convictions in place. So, yeah, there wasn't malice, but it was certainly a pretty astonishing series of errors that they've made. And that's why no one's really picked up on it because it wasn't until we went through with a fine tooth comb and scrutinised the legislation that we realised, hold on, what's happened here? And we had to read it a few times to actually get our heads around and to work through. And I, I actually took it to two different sets of lawyers to say, are we actually interpreting this correctly? It was me and Sherelle Moody. It was Sherelle Moody, who, who's a journalist for News Corp, who actually first discovered it, and she approached me, and we were both sort of looked at it and talked about it and got legal advice. So Sherelle was the one who actually first, she had a survivor approach her, and she and I both report for News Corp, and Sherelle was working on this story, and the survivors from Victoria, and she, she spoke to me because she knows that I was doing the Let Her Speak campaign and that I've done a lot of work around the different jurisdictions and when survivors can and cannot speak and she also spoke to the lawyers and then uh, we all sort of put our heads together and then we got another set of lawyers involved, Mark lawyers, who have given us a lot of advice and at first there was a lot of back and forth and a bit of confusion about, hold on, this can't actually be the case, can it? And then the more it was scrutinised, the more it was like, yes, this is actually what this now means. This is the implication of the changes that they've made. Well, they, they weren't intentional. I don't think anybody set out one day and thought, how can we actually harm survivors? But I think in not doing their due diligence, they have caused a significant harm. And it was that lack of due diligence which was disrespectful in the first place. Well, and to add to that disrespect is the fact that you did attempt to bring this to the attention of the Victorian Attorney General's office, I believe, because this is where I'm at now. When I spoke to Ballarat survivors, some of them were of the opinion that, oh, no, I I actually don't think it's a problem. I've been hearing that it's just a a clerical error, it it was a mistake, it's an accident, and they had no idea and they're about to fix it. But then Rereading your article, you, you're so assertive in what you're saying. I thought, no, Nina knows her stuff. This does not add up for so, me. Yes, okay. So to give to give a bit more information that might help fill in a few blanks for people. So Sherelle first wrote to the Attorney General flagging this as an issue back in April. I then wrote in May as a journalist. And the response at the time was extraordinarily wishy-washy, suggesting that there was no problem and that maybe we had the problem and that we weren't quite interpreting it correctly. That muddied the waters a bit. Then the following months, we'd spent a lot more time by then with the lawyers going through it all. And so End Rape on Campus wrote a seven-page letter on behalf of the two survivors who have been in the media this week, detailing every aspect of how the law had failed them and where it had failed them on a technical on technical grounds and then what the trauma impacts were. Now that email was ignored for over that seven page letter was ignored for over a month until a follow up one was sent saying, Look, this is still this is a really big problem. What are you going to do about this? Finally since then the Victorian Attorney General has begun to engage and she referred Andre on campus to another person to make contact with in the government and that person was sent emails and they never responded either. So it's been, it's been pretty disappointing that it's taken this amount of media pressure to say, 
you need to fix this. This is a problem. And the new narrative that, you know, government always spins, they will always spin against a story, particularly when they've stuffed up because it's embarrassing they've stuffed up and they've made an error. And so the new story that they're saying is that, oh, it's only one word that's a problem here. And it was a drafting error, almost like a typo. <laughs> that's complete bullshit. Yeah, that's the story I'm hearing is that, oh, no, it's, it says and when it should have said or. It's just a simple mistake. So put it, put it this way. If they fix that one word that they're claiming is the problem, then the sisters would be no better off. They would still be gagged. They would still be unable to be named. So changing that one word would actually have a benefit. It would benefit uh, survivors in cases where there has been a guilty conviction who are currently gagged, but it would still leave entire like an entire paragraph, which is what you know far more than one word that needed to be rewritten. This is this was not just a one word typo. This was something that went through both uh, houses of parliament that would have had dozens and dozens of people look over it. It wasn't a one word typo. It was it was a systemic failing. You know, it's really disappointing as well that. This has been raised with their office over and over and over since April, and it's only now that in response to media pressure, as opposed to survivors themselves, you know, it was survivors as well who were who were raising it from about May onwards, and now it's actually been, because it's blown up on the front page of the newspaper, that we're suddenly getting a reaction. And, I mean, it's good that we're finally getting a re- reaction, but it would have been better if it was if they decided to listen to the survivors themselves when they had approached the government rather than it needing to be the media fallout that's prompted them into action. What do you think about the suggestion that it's going to be fixed quickly? That's the other thing I keep hearing is that don't worry, it's a mistake. It's a little mistake and we're going to get right on top of it and fix it really quickly. Yeah, I guess I guess there's two two things I think about that. The first is I'm glad if it's going to be made a priority. I think it's important that it's made a priority, but it's also important that it is not rushed at such a great speed that they do it in a way that is, again, you know, half-assed and riddled with problems and introducing more problems. That's my concern is that if they rush it through in response to media pressure, then it's policy on the run and policy on the run can be policy underdone. And that's my concern is that if they could make this mistake the first time around, then they're evidently capable of making the same mistake or a different mistake, I should say, if they don't do it right. So we want them to do it as soon as possible, provided they also do it in a way which is responsible this time and appropriate and with adequate survivor input. And I have to say, speaking of responsibility, I think it's really disappointing that some media outlets are sort of spinning this yarn that it's not a big deal either because I'm finding that, that's, as I said earlier, that's coming back to me then from the survivor mm. community. And I think, well, you know, there are a lot of people now who've broken this law in the last seven months without knowing. I think that is a pretty significant issue, actually, especially now that we know that you have been trying to raise the issue for months with no even response. There's a couple of things to say to that. Some of the problematic reporting that I've seen has said, firstly, they were saying it's hashtag fake news. Um, I saw a couple of journalists saying that on, on social media and then now they look a bit silly because now the government has confirmed, yes, this this really is a problem. This, this has happened and this is the implication, even if it wasn't intended. So now there's, an, there's a recognition finally that there is a problem here at law. The suggestion of, oh, but, you know, no one will be prosecuted, like I, I think that misses entirely the point, which is that at law it is now illegal. And when you say that this is now illegal, that will have an effect on newsrooms. And I can tell you, as a journalist, I can tell you the effect is that an editor will say to me, that story is too hard to tell. Is there a story like that, but from New South Wales that we can tell instead? Because it is a risk. It is always a legal risk. And as you know, media lawyers tend to be more on the conservative side of things and don't want us to break the law, even if the risk of prosecution for us is low. But that's not even beginning to address the risk to the survivor. And it's not just a legal risk. And this is what I can't stress strongly enough. There is a trauma risk around this, which is when you are saying to somebody who has already been silenced first by the violence, then by the criminal justice system and the trauma that goes with the criminal justice system, if you are now saying to them, it is technically illegal for you to tell your story and the only way around that is for you to go back to court, 
describing them within yet another legal process where they feel like they don't have control over the outcome necessarily. We have also just learnt in the last um, little while that those who are applying for court orders are being told that they need to seek the view of their offender as to whether or not they're granted the court order so they can be named. And that makes me sick because, again, it's, um, you know, some people have also gone, oh, well, it's a tick the box. You go and you get a court order and you just pay a fee and, you, you know, you do the paperwork and there you go. They're not understanding the trauma implications of that, of asking people to go back into a court system that they may have found quite traumatising the first time and then also on top of that, asking them to seek their offenders' views on them being named. Oh, absolutely. I'm thinking about a, a woman who we've interviewed who was abducted and raped at seven. I mean, really? Is she expected to go and seek that offender's approval to be able to tell her story now? Yeah, it's, it's, it's appalling. It's appalling. And so, you know, it's, um, it has been a little bit discouraging that there has been some of that rhetoric out there this week of, oh, it'll all be changed very quickly or it was just one word problem or, you know, survivors, they just need to fill out a bit of paperwork. I think the thing that we need to focus on really is, well, hold on, how do we ensure that something like this never happens again in the future? How do we get appropriate processes in place when laws are being changed so that even once this particular debacle is ironed out, and I hope it is ironed out, swiftly but appropriately but even after that what do we do in future to prevent this from happening again because this was not a one-word problem but it also wasn't just one person who passed this legislation there were teams of people and I think that in and of itself warrants some conversation about well what are the accountability mechanisms here like where how did this happen why has it there hasn't actually been an apology yet you'll note from anyone which is which is interesting I believe there have been personal apologies, which is also interesting. There have been personal phone calls, but no public statements of apology. Well, I can tell you that, it, like, it's interesting who they're calling and who they're not calling because the right. main survivor okay. in the case who we've given the student in Maggie has not received anything from government. She hasn't received really? a phone call. No, she hasn't. So they've, they, I know they have made some contact with some survivors and I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy for those survivors because all survivors need that reassurance. But it is interesting that they appear to be going to the high-profile media survivors, but they haven't actually spoken to the woman who has kick-started all of this or anyone who's, who's representing her to apologise to her, nor have they apologised more broadly for the, um, you know, I, I think that they're engaging in some spin and minimisation tactics to try to downplay it a bit, which again, for me, raises some concerns around the authenticity and integrity of their message because saying, oh, this is a one-word problem and it was a, just a drafting error um, and, oh, we're going to get this fixed quickly. Well, you're only responding because of the media heat. Well, I had some back and forth yesterday with the Office of the Victorian Attorney General, Jill Hennessy, but I was unable to, to get her to speak, so... I guess we're still waiting to hear from her about it specifically. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and thank you for doing that. I mean, I think that the more people who are asking questions, and I know that there are a lot of members of the public um, and other survivors out there as well who have been asking a lot of questions and sharing petitions and so on, who just by asking the question, it sends a very strong message to government, which is that people care about this issue and they care about survivors. Well, congratulations, Nina, and thank you. What an excellent job, both you and Sherelle. Thank God that you picked it up and bothered to keep pushing it through and reported it. Thank you so much. Cheers. After the break, we hear from a survivor whose life's been turned upside down by Nina's report on the changes to Victoria's legislation. As you know, we can't name the woman we're about to hear from, although her voice will be familiar to many of you because she's worked very hard to make it so. She was groomed and abused as a child by an authority figure in the community and her decision to speak about it has cost her and other family members dearly. Not only has she realised she's broken the law on a daily basis since it was passed, but also that it has the potential to derail a process she's been working through for a very long time. Hey, how are you? Ah, oh, it's been an absolute maddening day. How are you? 
Good, I'm good. It's really good to see you. We've been following along, obviously, and yeah, and it feels like you've had some really big wins, and now this, yeah, yeah, just another you know hurdle in this long journey. Like we we haven't had enough. We just thought throw another one at us. So, what do you make of all of this now? Okay, so we Dan Andrews called us last night, and so that was very reassuring. We felt you know, that this was was a stuff up. Uh, Jill Hennessy did call us this morning as well and reassure us that the laws will be changed, not quick enough for us because uh, September 21st is our big decision and we can't actually speak about that on September 21st. So we have begun the process of applying to lift that gag so that that will happen before these laws are changed. But the fact that we even have to do that is it's just excruciating. And the fact that this was something that was put into place for survivors to have to overcome this hurdle, even if it was a mistake. I had so many survivors call me yesterday and just say the fact that this has been done, that it wasn't carefully considered of exactly how this was going to affect people that have so little choice already. I mean, that should have never have happened. I did a couple of articles yesterday and the fact that, you know, I read the articles and I'm anonymous, I felt like crying. I mean, I felt like I had been told that the law was telling me that there was something to be ashamed about what we were doing. And I know that that was not the intention, but that was how it felt. After the courage it took for you to speak. So I'm confused now about how how can we talk about what we're talking about? Please guide me in terms of how do we discuss this? What's the best way that we can talk through this with the most detail? Yeah, so my understanding from our lawyers, because we've, we've spoken to them extensively for hours over the last two days, so our understanding of the law is that we cannot say anything that identifies us as victims or the case that we are involved in. We can't talk about that. We can't talk about anything else that doesn't identify us as victims in that case. So it, it's confusing. It's very, I said to him, well, what about talking to those media? Does that the law still apply there? And he couldn't give me, it's very ambiguous. The whole law is completely ambiguous. So he doesn't actually know, but he said, we can't talk about our case or anything that identifies us. But we can talk about, let's say, this. We can talk about how we feel about this. So for the purposes of this podcast, we could say that you're a person we've spoken to before, maybe. I don't know. We can't use your name. We can't talk about any specifics, obviously, because it's quite specific. But we can say that you are pursuing a case. Because that's the other thing that's confusing. I thought this law only pertained to cases in which the offender had been convicted, which is not the case for you. No. So the law, no. No, so the law actually covers everything from 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 the process of uh, the 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 uh, case being involved in any way with the police charges anything until the conviction and then after the conviction as well. So it basically covers everything in in any steps of the process. Um, and since our case is pending, even though we checked multiple times with our lawyers about if it's pending, it's not technically pending. Pending an extradition case might mean different to pending in Victoria. There's no, there's no issue number. There's no, you know, it's not in front of a court. Does it still apply to us? Because charges have been uh, uh, laid, even though they haven't been assigned to, the case is still considered pending. So therefore, the law covers us. When did you find out about this? Yesterday and today. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? These laws have been in place since February. Yeah. And uh, we've spoken publicly about our case multiple times since February. We had a whole press conference. So uh, we were not aware of this war- law and uh, the fact that the news, you know, that it was in the news made us aware that actually what we had been doing according to the law was wrong. Is that how you found out? Yeah. You read about it? Yeah. I think I, I saw the news.com. Someone alerted me to the news.com article very early in the morning. Uh, probably at seven or eight in the morning, I don't know, whenever it came out, someone, uh, quite a few people sent it to me and just said, we're aware of it. And when I first read the article, I wasn't, I, I didn't understand that it actually pertained to us. Um, but then obviously I got onto our lawyers pretty quickly and they read through the actual act and said it absolutely applies to us as well. And keeping the profile of your case high, keeping it in front of people's faces and keeping the public aware and passionate about your case has been such a big part of it, right? Oh, absolutely. The case wouldn't be where it is if the fact that we hadn't gone public and publicised everything that we could about how, you know, convoluted this case was. Yeah. I mean, that's the only reason that that we're hopefully going to see justice soon. 
Do you think that prosecutions will arise out of this law, given that it seems to be a mistake and that you have assurances that it will be changed soon? Well, I asked our lawyers, can we then just speak and just assume, assume that we won't be prosecuted? And he said, no, we actually can't. Now that we're aware of the law, of the law, um, we can't actually do that without, uh, without being um, applying to the court and getting that gag lifted, which is what we have begun the process to do today. What sort of financial costs are you up for in applying for that? So uh, generally that would cost uh, within, you know, thousands of dollars, but we've been very lucky that we've had uh, several different barristers and lawyers approach us and say that they're willing to do it pro bono. Oh, that is unreal. Yeah. That's fantastic. It's just a matter of how quickly that can happen and if it can happen before September 21st. How are the other people involved? <laughs> Uh, really, I mean, like, it's just, it's so unbelievable. Mm. And I've just, we all just feel so disempowered and so silenced. And it's a really horrible thing to be silenced, especially when we, we, we were not silenced before. And, you know, we had such a public profile to now be silenced. Just, it just feels so horrible. You've had a particularly difficult period of time. Again, I'm trying so hard not to identify you, but obviously you're in Victoria, you're here in Melbourne, you know, we've been locked down, we've had our own COVID dramas. I know that you lost a family member not so long ago, and you had a strained relationship with the family member. So on top of the the strain of this case that has been with you for a long time, this is just that extra thing you didn't need. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was just one thing that I never imagined that we would have to even fight. And now the fact that we have to fight it, it it's just how could it, how could have we got to this point that this is what we're doing and this is what with expanding energy that we don't have on. Good old 2020, eh? Mm-hmm. Just keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> Can you travel to for the September nah. thing or how? No, nah, we can't travel. We do Zoom and we do have people in court that are telling us, you know, minute by minute updates of what's happening, which has always been super helpful to us. Uh, if we could travel to we would definitely be there, but we can't and we are expecting a positive result. So ah, it would be amazing to be there. But the fact that not only can we not be there, but we also will have to be silenced and actually can't say anything about it is just too much to bear. If we get a positive result on the 21st, that basically means, I mean, there'll be an appeal on that, but then, uh, and then the Justice Minister has to sign off on it and there'll be an appeal on that. But we're basically right at the end. We're at the pointy end of it. And it could happen by the end of this year, early next year. Yeah, so then charges are laid and then it goes through the usual process. There'll be a committal hearing, there'll, you know, um, there'll be a trial date set and so on and so forth. We'll be dealing with the Victorian justice system. Yeah. Well, we'll be talking to you then, and surely you'll be able to to speak again by then. I really hope so. Thank you to Nina Fennell and our mystery guest, and also to all the listeners who contacted us about this issue. It was really great to hear from you. Thank you to our patrons, including Lisa V, Sir Alfie Sparkle, Stacey Walker, Luke S, Guberson, Mac Eleni. I hope I've said that right. Claire, Brett Sharman, Sarah Bugaya, Kylie Voigt and Switch City King. Thank you for downloading this episode of Australian True Crime made in association with the Acast Creator Network. We'll be back next week. Look at that. Isn't it glorious? That amazing golden aura. The incredible yellows and oranges. The warm, reassuring glow. I can look at it all day. Are you talking about the sunset or your Macca's hash brown? Crunchy, delicious, potatoey. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Need a hash brown at sundown? Rise and shine anytime with Macca's delicious all-day brekkie and a smooth barista-made McCafe coffee. Drive through today. Mm-hmm.